Welcome to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, where we aim to give swimming the coverage and publicity it deserves. Every week, we celebrate the sport we love with amazing special guests and topics from around the swimming pool. And now, here are your hosts, Scott and Dan. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. For this week's show, we have a jam-packed lineup for you. Not only at the end of a Zoom call is Dan, but we also have two former GB swimmers and now podcast hosts in Lauren Quigley and Jazz Carling. Hey guys, how are you all doing? Let's just go for it. All four of you, all three of you at once. <laughs> everyone together. All good, thank No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm good, thank you. Can't complain. Yeah, all is good. I think it's um some days easier than others. Um, but it feels like things are starting to get back to some kind of normal and that we've got a few uh, things to look forward to, which is always nice. But um yeah, doing good. How about you guys? I'm pretty good. Uh sorry, I haven't spoken yet, Scott, so I thought I'd jump in here as well. <laughs> but uh <laughs> yeah, no whip, I'm pretty good. I'm actually really excited for this podcast, actually. We've got some uh, really good topics to talk about. I feel like we could talk forever about the topics that are like going around the world right now. But um we wanna kind of reduce it down to some. So so I think I'm, I'm really excited about it. We yeah. can't stop talking sometimes. So um <laughs> that's what we find sometimes. We just like wander off in all kinds of directions. But no, it'd be really good to chat to you and uh yeah, it'd be it's strange being now we've been hosting our own podcast. It's a bit strange mm. being guest on one too now. <laughs> Yeah, so for this week's show, we are going to take a deep dive into the Honest Athletes podcast, kind of why you guys set it up, um, what kind of are the future aims and goals of it. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about life after retiring from sport, because it's not really a topic that's kind of spoken about enough. And there's not as much support when it comes to life after swimming that there really should be. So why don't we kick things off with why did you set up the podcast? What's the main idea and aim behind it? Well, <laughs> it was really, um, so myself and Lauren, obviously we've been on many teams together and we've been very lucky to travel the world, go to world championships together. And I guess along that you do make amazing friendships and things. And um, yeah, Lauren was always one of the closest friends like on, on the teams and stuff. So um, we decided to, to do some work together, some camps um, abroad Um and I think one thing was quite clear from when we both retired, actually, um, is like our passion for being able to help people with their swimming and be able to support people with their journey, no matter whether your goal is just to swim 50 metres or whether your goal is to go on and achieve high dreams. Um, we want, I think we share that joint goal that we just want to be able to help and be able to make a difference and give back to a sport that's been part of our lives for so long. So we decided to do some camps and um, a few different bits. And then I remember it was, uh, well, we were coming to the start of an, the third lockdown in the UK where pools were being closed. And I remember I sent Quigley a message and I said, shall we do a podcast? Like, I've always wanted to do a podcast. And she said, I've been thinking exactly the same thing. I've wanted to do a podcast. Why don't we do one together? So instead of all the planning and thinking, oh, let's do this podcast, it was really quite um, random, spontaneous thing. And I think we recorded either within a few days. We'd done like the first episode. Um, but one thing is for sure, we've just loved talking, sharing experiences and I think one thing that makes it feel so great is when you get stories of people that can relate or it's been able to help people normalize certain feelings, either life away from sport or um, the changes that you go through or all the different things that you go through as an athlete. And we've had it from not just swimming, from rowing, from triathlon, so many different sports as well that people can relate. And I think that's one thing that really resonates with us is how much we can make a difference to people and really help people along with their journey. So that's it in a bit of a nutshell. I'm not sure about you, Quigley, if you've got anything to add to that. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like you've you've basically summed it up perfectly. It was we we started working together and and quickly realised. I think even before we started to work together, that we have a similar, like Jazz said, passion for staying in the sport and what we can do with it and how we can help really. And so yeah, we we 
started to talk about it in camps and stuff like that and obviously planned all that in lockdown two so lockdown three we we couldn't really plan anymore um and then obviously jazz said she she asked about the podcast and literally within a few days we'd recorded we were keen to do it and had the conversation of what's the best way that we can help and uh, right now you know with limited resources of of being able to reach people or or connect in, in different ways and so yeah talking on the podcast I think and being honest the honest athletes to share our own experiences we have two very different stories and although we were on teams together and everything and we're great friends. We went through two very different experiences. And so both sides with both of those sides, you know, we talked about, yeah, we could continue as solo and just do our own thing. But one of the best things that I've done definitely is to join forces and to, to go at it as a collaboration. I think you reach a lot more people and, and you have a wider net of this is what we went through and if something, if I can't help someone with something, Jazz can step in and, and help and vice versa, hopefully. So, yeah, and it's just been fun. Like we said on our, I think maybe our second episode, it's been like unpaid therapy, really. <laughs> so if anyone's struggling out there, just get a friend, start a podcast and just get chatting. It's free. Um, but no, it, it's been brilliant and the response has been fantastic. So I think we can relate to that a little bit because I don't think I've spoken to Scott as much as I have done since doing this podcast, we literally, we speak to each other every day now because of doing this podcast. Um, and I think it's great that you're not just catering to the elite side, but you're doing pretty much every aspect of swimming. Like today, I, I recently heard your, um, the, the episode with your mums. I thought that was brilliant. I thought it was a really good idea. I thought we, we might actually steal that idea because it's just, I don't want those stories coming out from my dad. <laughs> yeah. I definitely do. So I think you should make it happen. <laughs> so, like Dan said, there's so many amazing topics that you've talked about kind of throughout your career and so many that are relatable to us. Um, was lockdown kind of the starting point of this podcast or do you think it would have happened naturally anyway because you guys are helping people out? And I know, Lauren, you did your own kind of Instagram interviews during, what was it, around Christmas time? Did it kind of, it kind of naturally followed on from that, didn't it? Uh, yeah, I, I think I obviously did my own the core room series and love talking to different athletes about different you know things that they've gone through and actually had jazz as a guest on one of those, um, which was brilliant. And so I think I think it would have happened or something similar, definitely, just from us naturally connecting and working together in person with people. I think we we probably would have maybe at a later stage gone to um you know different how can we reach out to more people Mm. and I do think that a podcast would have come out of it um maybe not as soon but I do think something like it would have come out I don't know about you Jazz that's a that's a really good question I think it is naturally like I in the past listened to quite a few different podcasts I've not often really listened to sports ones um I've listened to all kinds of ones but um I think, yeah, I think one of the things that is great about podcasts is the power to be able to connect with a lot of different people. And when you've got a podcast on and you're just listening to the voices and the words, it really is really powerful tool to be able to connect with people. So I don't know whether it would have happened as soon as it did um, if we hadn't have maybe gone through another lockdown. But I think it would have definitely been something that um, I would. Well, I would have. I've always wanted to for quite a long time. Um to do a podcast so I think it's just been a great way to be able to connect with people and even the other day we got a message from a young girl and she said that she listens to it with her mum every week and how it's like their bonding time and it was just like so special that when you can actually connect with people and bring people together and it's still a bit strange that people can be just listening to you on um on the podcast or watch my mum loves watching every week even though she knows all the stories she still loves like watching and um she loves watching us on YouTube she likes having seeing us have fun and have a laugh and that's the thing we do have fun but we also go through quite emotional times and hard times and tough times as well so 
it's not all just showing all the fun, the great times that we've had. It's actually really delving into some of those tougher times that sport does take you through and life does take you through. So, um, yeah, it's, it, as quickly said, it is a bit like therapy. You kind of talking about your feelings, emotions, and that you've probably not really ever addressed or actually openly spoken about with people. But for some reason on a podcast, when you just sat with your friend having a chat, it just feels so easy just to open up and talk about all these different experiences that, that we've been through. I dread to think if there's another lockdown, what we'll be doing next, Jess. <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think it's great what you're, what you're both doing. And some of the topics that you've talked about have been ones that people should be talking about all the time. I think um, I, I said earlier about your mum's podcast uh, and then the retiring in your 20s was really quite eye opening to me um, because swimming is quite a grueling sport. And we talked about it last week about the dropout in swimming, especially in like the teenagers, the late teenagers. Um, and it's something that does need to be addressed more. So what, what's the sort of advice that you would offer to those sort of age group of swimmers? It is a really tough one, and it's it's something, again, that we want to be able to support, and we've spoken a lot about in... We spoke about the junior to senior transition and um, mm. how we changed, I guess, from going from that age group athlete, going to nationals or competing against the ones that are the best in the age group to then go on to the senior ranks and how big a change it is. Um And again, both different experiences. I plateaued for three years and didn't see any signs of improvement. And I could have easily walked away from the sport at that time. Um, But I was given an opportunity just before my 17th birthday to move to Swansea. And I guess if I hadn't have had that opportunity, I don't think I'd be here today talking about it. I I definitely don't think I'd have maybe achieved some of the things I did in the sport. Um, But for me, it's really important to openly have conversations like we're having now and we talk about a lot from the female perspective is all the changes that you go through, the body changes um, and all the things that you kind of the hormones and things that you go through as a youngster. And there are a lot of distractions at that age and your friends are starting to do different things. And you're like, oh, do I want to go out or why do I want to be getting in a pool at this time early in the morning and all those kinds of things? Um, but we would love to promote, um, promote more people staying in the sport. And I think one thing that's so important is just to stay, just to stick with it, to try and encourage people to just stick with it. And I often say that you never know where the sport could take you. It might not just be swimming up and down a pool. It might take you to triathlon, open water swimming, or there's so many different routes that it can take. But, um, I think talking for both of us, swimming has got us through a lot of tough times and challenging times and, through life and it's kind of been like a support for us so having swimming and being able to it will go it'll go with with us well I'm talking on the both of us quickly but I feel like it will be with us for life you know and you guys will know that swimming is so great for health fitness well-being being able to escape and it's not just swimming up and down a pool there's so many different things that you can do and I think for me just being in water I just feel so relaxed and calm but I think one of the most important things is just trying to keep people in the pool and training and stick with it and um, it's not just about pushing seeing how hard you can push and whether you can be the best in your age group it's about swimming for all those other reasons and how it can make you feel so um yeah it's definitely something that we we want to promote and we want to be able to support kids going through those changes and um it is very normal like I think from a young well from that age of 14 to 17 I was questioning whether I would carry on with the sport but it is normal to have those kind of thoughts but I'm so glad that I stuck with it and the benefits that it's given me not just from going to the experiences and onto the elite level but the experiences that the friendships the um like the coaches that support you and kind of make you into a better person and all those kinds of different things that it can bring to you I think it's really important to promote those kind of things yeah I think I just with with regards to retiring in your 20s or retiring early I think the I, I saw someone say on Twitter the other day it was about social media glorifying sport and just showing the great times and the personal bests and the records medals and all you know just all the great stuff and it does contain a lot of that you know as everyone probably well speaking on this podcast and hopefully a lot of people listening that have gone through swimming or a sport just in general um knows that there are those highs but majority of it is working hard you know uh plateauing like jazz said um, you know, having injuries, illness, lots of hard, tough things to deal with as well. But I think 
just remembering that when you do go on social media or you see people at the, the, on TV at sporting events or whatever it is, you see those short snippets where there's a big journey around that that's filled with all sorts of moments. And if you are going through a plateau or something like that, um, it happens to everyone. It's a normal thing. And with regards to when you do finish, we touched on it and, and we, we love to reiterate whenever we can that, I mean, Jazz says it all the time and I love it when she says it. It's like, it's great to have the medals and the, the records and everything at the end. But it's more important what kind of person you are and, you know, how your journey was. Did you have a good journey? A good journey doesn't mean, oh, I went to the Olympics and I won a gold medal. A good journey is, do I have a lot, you know, do I have great friends all around the world? Or was I lucky enough to travel? Or my friends even just at my own club? You know, there's so much to it. Um, so, yeah, that's, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Almost like the yeah. life lessons you learn from swimming, I guess. If I, if I take it from a different angle, I mean, I stopped swimming at 16, 17, but kind of the discipline that I built up from doing the early mornings, the five o'clock in the pool, all stuff like that, that translated really well into doing a university degree because I had that self-motivation, that self-discipline, and then doing a master's degree and everything on top of that. Um, but we, we spoke about there was a very obvious reason that I left the sport and that was because I wasn't getting PBs and there was a massive focus on times within swimming. Um, do you think there's kind of, there could be a culture shift within the sport to look at more enjoyment and these lessons rather than the pressure of improving your time, winning races, because we, we had a look at kind of, comparing what happens in the UK to over in America where kids do generally stay in racing a little bit longer and they have bigger squads over in the college systems. And that's because they're racing for points for their team kind of team meets are a bit more prevalent over there. Is that something that could have or could be addressed in this country, kind of a shift away from the PBs and a shift towards, I don't know, a bit more kind of arena league style for those who just aren't quite getting to the, the elite end that you two got to? Um, I think with comparing so Britain to the UK, there's a big contrast in those two. Mm. Um, in, the, in, in America, it's like, it's positive. I want to win. Yeah, come on, win. You know, we're going to win and, da, 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 and USA and all that, and which is amazing to see because in the UK, we have this big... I don't know what what how you'd call it, but it's like it's embarrassing to admit that you want to win, or people don't want to come across arrogant if they want to win, and so we're more like take part, have fun, you know, it doesn't matter, blah blah blah. And there's no right or wrong, you know, they're just very very different, and so I think there'd have to be a massive culture shift because there's so much pressure on coaches to you know performance based that's what it is i need this many kids to go to the nationals i need this many kids to get to here blah blah, blah. and and a lot of it is down to ego but a lot of it is pressure to sometimes even keep a job and so then that trickles down into the into the swimmers i feel um and that pressure on purpose or not goes on to them as well of course because they're the ones that are going to get me to have the numbers to be able to, or just to be successful. Um, and so I think it'd have to be a big, a big shift in a lot of different ways mm. for swimmers to stay within and enjoy it. Um, I'm a big believer in what you've just said of like, just enjoy it. You know, it's important. It's impo It's really hard when you um, do enjoy it it's, it's almost impossible so if you don't enjoy it it's not going to be possible and you are going to finish sooner than mm. than you probably should or could or not reach potential so I think a lot would have to change to get to that point um, but I mean is it possible maybe I don't know what do you think Jazz? I think another thing is I don't feel like there's necessarily like enough education and kids are like shown and taught and hear about things like we just that you will there will be plateaus there will be times where you're not achieving times and whether there's I don't know whether there's enough education about things like um 
loop recovery, fuel infiltrate, nutrition. We talk about it quite a lot. Um, all those kinds of other bits that come with just swimming up and down a pool, whether you're making sure you're doing like physio, like looking after your body in other ways. And um, obviously a lot of clubs are dependent on like volunteers and things like that. So the support, but I feel like there's, that's why one of the things we wanted to share is trying to be able to help people and normalizing that there will be plateaus. You will not always improve. Um, but there's so many other things you can focus on. And I think, yeah, as you said, it, it's not always about the time. And I think um, we're taught that everything is driven towards, whether it's making the county times, the regionals, the nationals, um, there's always something, to, a time to aim for, which can be great at times. But I think um, one thing that's so important is actually enjoying the process of trying to get, get to there or to improve and all those little things that you can do. And in terms of the American kind of system, I think there are a lot more, there seems to be a lot more opportunities over there from, um, it's not just going to those kind of top colleges. Um, you can go to various different colleges and on a sport scholarship and have various different opportunities to race competitions. And I think that opens a lot more doors and it keeps a lot of people in the sport a lot longer. And you don't just feel like it's just you, you're a part of a bigger team. And that's the kind of general feel that I get from from over in America. And do I think that it could keep more people? In, yeah, I definitely think it could make a difference over here. Um, obviously, as Brits, we are a lot different. But I think um, that kind of system of racing a bit more, the excitement, doing it for your team, points and things like that is very exciting, I think. And I used to love, like my fondest memories as a junior was racing in the summer league that we used to have against all the local clubs, the fi summer league final, the winter league final, we used to have the junior leagues. Um, and I used to love that being with my friends, teammates, racing, relays um, was just so much fun. And I think that fun element sometimes can be taken out of it when so much focus is on going to nationals or trying to win medals, those kinds of things that can put a lot of people and drive a lot of people out of the sport. So I think um, definitely things like the Arena League is great and trying to get teams just involved in how much fun, you know, and I love seeing like, everyone you know in face paint and cheering on their and like how much it means to see their friends and teammates swimming well I just love it and I think I if was we just gonna say just quickly um it's almost like our introduction was jewel in the pool to like the college point system mm -hmm. and that was unbelievable to be able to do that wasn't it so I can imagine that's why people are so excited to stay within the sport maybe more opportunities like that yeah I think our kind of hope is that the isl format kind of eventually trickles down into maybe even if it starts at bucks level and rather than just bucks being one meet at sheffield i know there's the odd varsity meet but if there's just exposure that slowly trickles down through the age groups and through clubs maybe that kind of forms a different format for swimming which kind of i don't know will hopefully keep people in swimming and give those who aren't going to get those national times or those elite levels, hopefully it gives them a path for enjoyment and success. Yeah, I definitely think that. And um, it would be great to see kids again, just having that enjoyment factor and not always just chasing certain times or positions and things like that, where they're ranked. I think the fun element, the enjoyment. And one thing when you speak to a lot of the athletes that went to the ISL is how much fun they had. They they always say like how great it was. And like, it was all about the team. They were finishing races and they weren't talking about times. They were talking about, oh, they've got points in the team and where the standings and this and that. There was less of a focus on the times, which like, I think as like an ex I love like obviously seeing the times and seeing really fast swims. I actually love seeing that as a spectator, but I think that's because... I've been so heavily involved in swimming. I actually really enjoy watching like people swim really quick and swim really well and seeing like a perfect rate. Well, not a perfect, but like a really great race plan. I love seeing that being pulled off, but I guess from an outsider and um, from someone that's competing in the swimming side of it, um, how much fun it is. And you want to do it for your team. You want to get points on the board for your team. Um, so I would love to, yeah, I would love to see, something like that i think it's a great idea well scott came up with a really good suggestion last week saying that it, the unis should race each other almost like a varsity type thing or jewel in the pool where for example be loughborough versus bath and then do that as a weekend and then so it's almost like a glamorified um 
it's almost like a, an arena league or speedo league, but for the, the big levels, and it kind of has different divisions, almost like the football league, I suppose. So the division three, division two, and it kind of goes up like that. But I thought it was a really good idea and probably should be done like that to keep people in the sport, like you're saying, um, because enjoyment has to be the number one factor for, well, not just for swimming, but for most sports, I feel. Yeah, I think, I think that would be a great idea. I think um, maybe more racing as well. I don't think there's mm. enough opportunities for that age group. Um, and so I think more more of those kind of races to keep people excited and keep the momentum going. I think the problem is sometimes we have a great meet and then it's lost because nothing happens then for a while and everyone sort of forgets and you just get into your own routine again. Um, so I think the definitely the doing those events, but keeping the momentum for them as well. Is that something you guys kind of found throughout your career that there was a lack of racing opportunities for you guys over here? Would you have liked more chance to get in the pool and race kind of before the Olympics or before trials? Do you think you would have been in a better place for it? I do think racing is really important. And um, one of the things, well, from the yearly calendar, the coach would always plan what competitions we're going to. And if I'm honest, the majority of competitions without sounding bad, but the ones that I'd get most excited were were the ones like the French Open where I knew I was going to be racing some of my like closest rivals or um, the Mare Nostrums where you're competing against a really strong field of Europeans. Um, So I think for me, like it would be great to see more. And I think even when you see sometimes that like the Edinburgh International and you see some international races come over, I think that's great. But I think um, once I kind of got to more of the senior elite level um for me I was most excited about racing like the best competitors around the world I wanted to see how often I could race against them and there wasn't as many opportunities in the UK to race against um my kind of rivals in well in the pool so um it would be great to have more competitions I think um I loved competing I think as a distance athlete is maybe less so as important I would rather get in a great block of training and have competitions in there whereas I think um for the more sprints athletes I think having the race experience and standing up and doing some world-class fast swims week on week is really important um whereas like my coach would be drilling into me doing big meters every week and trying to compete at the end of those weeks would be tough so I think um it's all about balance but I think having more of those kind of competitions in the UK would be useful and um it'd be great again like not well the thing is sometimes I love traveling you know and being able to go to Barcelona for the weekend and you get to go to a lot of cool places so that is some of the perks of it but it would be great to have some some over in the UK too I think that would be that would be a lot of fun as well yeah I just to insert there as well Jazz has just mentioned the men ostrom and that's the first thing that came to mind was British swimming always try to make sure that the the guys on the team at least were going to the, to do the series every year because it's just it's a it's a you know it's week in week out of racing and each week normally or each um competition you got better a little bit better so i think that frequency of racing can help massively um and again like jazz just said athletes are very individual everyone likes their own preferences of when they want to race how often when's best for them to race so it's obviously your own preference but having the opportunity to race I also think obviously athletes chase money not a lot of money in swimming so the swimmers are going to chase wherever in the world there is money and the UK don't really offer that right now I don't know if the Manchester International meet has started maybe I might have got that wrong I don't know um but you notice certain athletes, the best athletes in the world, the smartest athletes in the world were chasing the moneyed events. And that's where you'd get your, like Jazz was saying, the field that the best in the world are at and those that want to race. So, Do you both still race now, even though you've retired? Oh, no. I race to the fridge <laughs> oh, in the morning. <laughs> there's there's no masters coming up. <laughs> no, I think my racing days in swimming or over I think my racing days I don't know I mean you'd never say never like I might do like a couple of open water swims but I wouldn't try and do it competitively um Mm. from the swimming side of it uh it's more for enjoyment now I think for me I'm I'm never going to have those same feelings and I would always compare if I raced again in the pool I would always compare to what I was before um and I don't think I could just keep like a fresh page and just start again 
Um, so for me, it's more about like the feeling and enjoyment and having fun rather than trying to race and those kind of things. But I do miss the racing side of it, but not enough to want to get back in and race again. <laughs> I don't race anymore. Obviously, no one racing right now. Or well, some people are, but the majority aren't. Mm. Um, but again, like jazz, I just like, I just enjoy it. I just like to do what I enjoy. If I fancy doing something, I'll do it. I'd love to do an Ironman we're both on doing Zwift. We don't do Zwift races, but we both jump on there. And, you know, we're, we're still doing stuff, but it's not a hundred backstroke trying to break the minute and make the GB team, you know, we're not doing that. <laughs> so if pools were back to normal, would you guys still be going for a dip? Would you still be kind of writing out a training set and doing kind of one or two sessions a week? No, no I, I'd, I'd still get in, definitely. Um, I think a lot of people finish swimming and hate it and don't want anything to do with it and stay well away from it. Um, and I did, there was a point where I could have definitely finished on that note of hating it. Um, but I really wanted to just love it and finish loving it. Even though I didn't have the fire to race, I wanted to love it. And that's what I did. And I do, and I'd still get in and swim. My mum still swims. So I swim with her. She beats me sometimes, which is and I and you think I'm joking seriously she's an an insane she's the former international swimmer herself yeah yeah she's she definitely uh, puts me through my paces but yeah I just enjoy (laughs) being in the water you know I think Jazz again said it before I love being in the water it's sort of Mm. where I feel at home so I wouldn't necessarily need to go right I need to do 2050s at this and do this time I would just get in and swim for fun and just train with mum really Mm. Yeah, I would be, I would like to think I'd still be swimming in the pool or open water now. Um, I have enjoyed more so swimming in open water, especially in those summer months um, recently and just enjoying being outside and more for that kind of feeling of it makes me feel alive being in the open water. Um, but I would definitely be going to the pool at some stage. I don't know whether it would be as structured as like once a week or those kinds of things. And I do go in and I think whenever I go in for a swim, I do normally have a bit of a plan of how I'm going to swim. Because I think if I just swam a bit aimlessly, I wouldn't last very long. So I've always, I think the distance swimmer in me has always got a bit of a plan and it's normally quite long and boring and those kinds of things. But um, yeah, it's a shame because I would love to, I would love to be swimming and it, Last summer, I did get quite fit again in open water. I think I went up to the most I'd ever swam since I'd retired. It was like six or seven K. Um, but I just loved it. And I was actually starting to get quite competitive with myself again, like trying to, I had like a on my watch, seeing my pace and each week I would like be trying to get quicker. So I've still kind of got that little bit in me, but it's not enough to like push me and drive me. But I loved it. And especially swimming with like the sun on your back. I know if I was like in a nice warm country, I'd be out swimming most days I could imagine just because I love that feeling of being outside and the sun and swimming um, outdoors where we don't get much of that opportunity in the UK. (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting. I've spoken to a few swimmers who've kind of given up the pool life and a lot of them are enjoying open water even more them when they were in the wall like in the pool it's almost like a brand new sport because you've got no pace clock you've got no line at the bottom of the pool it's kind of I know people track it obviously on their smart watches but at the end of the day it's kind of swimming without any pressure um and I mean back when I was swimming I was a 50 and 100 swimmer but I did the great north swim what five years ago and did the 2k there and that was the most enjoyment I've ever had in a swimming race it was because it's a completely different feel yeah, I think open water is just such a incredible sport and it's hugely on the rise and people are trying it out. And um, I think all the benefits, it's starting to come out with a lot of research about the benefits of being in open water and some of the stories about how it's impacted people's lives and being outdoors and the feeling of being in water is um, incredible. And for me, I did try competitive open water swimming and did a few world cups and European championships, 10 kilometers swims. So um, I did give it a go and um, don't get me wrong. I loved it. I loved that. I would do kind of two sessions a week in open water. And some of my sessions would be like 12 K be super long Um but I absolutely loved it. And the distance didn't actually bother me. It was more swimming in like a really tight pack, someone kind of touching your feet the whole for two hours and the physical side of it. But the actual, actually open water swimming is incredible. And 
I absolutely love it. I think I am a bit precious. Like I like to go in nice, swim in nice places. I wouldn't necessarily swim in some not so nice places, but I do pick my open water locations wisely. And I just absolutely love it. The feeling. And when I get out, I ca- it's really hard to describe, but it just gives me this incredible feeling. And um, I don't necessarily get that same feeling now in the pool, which um, is nice. So it's, I do find like you just meet so many people as well that are so into it. And there's some people that would swim at my open water, local open water facility, and they would go every single day and like super early in the morning and they just do a couple of laps and um, it's like part of their morning routine. And I, when I was younger, I didn't feel like the opportunities were quite there for open water. Um, whereas I'd wish I tried it a bit younger and I might have actually, um, well, I don't know. You don't, you never know, but I wish I'd actually got used to it a bit younger and um, had those experiences because I think it is an incredible sport and again can lead on to so many other different things as well. Would you say open water is a good transition from the elite level to a a kind of a different sport because that doesn't seem to be a a proper pathway from winning let's say Olympic gold and then retiring there's no sort of pathway afterwards and there's a lot of people fall into the depression sort of side of it so would you sort of recommend that open water is a good idea or something to sort of venture into to to prevent depression from happening I think definitely finding new loves and passions is really important I think when you are known as a swimmer or swimming your whole life that's all you've ever known it kind of forms your whole identity and people know you for being the swimmer or, oh, you swim, you've swam for however many years and you kind of form yourself into just training to be the best swimmer in the pool. And you actually forget about a lot of other things. Like, what did I enjoy when I was being an athlete? What did I like doing? It's quite hard to look back because my life was so forged around being the fastest swimmer up and down that black line. Um, But for me, the open water, it did actually take... um, a bit of time for me to enjoy swimming again after I immediately retired. Um, Took maybe kind of six months, maybe a bit longer to start enjoying it again. Um, But I do think there does need to be more work um, on supporting athletes um, transitioning out of sport. And again, being able to support people to find out what they love doing. And I guess for me, it was trying out different sports I've not been able to do for a long time, getting on a road bike and um, running, which I don't necessarily enjoy. Um, I'm still planning on joining a netball club and things like that because sport and exercise has been part of my life and so many people's lives for so long. It's very easy to just come away from the sport and not want to do anything ever again. And um, I think it's really important to find new loves and passions that you actually really enjoy doing. Cause I think that can make a big difference from your kind of transition into the real world and getting used to um, not getting up so early in the morning and do all those training sessions and long hours. Lauren's not an open water swimmer, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I've had, I actually swam. I did um, when I was 14 or 15, I was an eight, I, my best event was 800 freestyle um and I said to mum I don't want to do it anymore I want to do sprint backstroke so she was like right okay um well just go out with a bang then if this is going to be your last one it was at nationals and I thought right okay I'll just give everything I've got I was in one of the earlier heats and I think I got a silver medal at nationals and so from that I got invited on all the open water stuff mm-hmm. which is obviously the opposite of what I wanted um but so I got the opportunity I was only young but I was I swam at the you mentioned the great swims I did the one at Salford Keys awful location to do your first open water race and I was in the elite wave it was on tv and I was with the likes of Kerry Ann Payne Cassie Patton just got absolutely slaughtered um and I'm pretty sure I touched things at the bottom of Salford Keys that you're not supposed to be touching but (laughs) there you go so that was my first uh open water experience in a race and it was awful I hated it um but then after well towards the end of my career I was out in Mallorca for the best fest I was with Hoob actually just trying out some of their suits and um Kerry Ann Payne was there with um her I can't I can't remember who she was with but she was out there doing sessions and her dad was out there and her friend and they were they were planning to do the open water relay race just as a bit of fun, really. And one of them had to drop out. So she asked me last minute, will you jump in? So I did an open water race in Mallorca with Kez and her, one of her friends and her dad. And that was just a bit of fun. And I love that. So two very polar opposite experiences. 
Um, that was nice on the beach, you know, sunny, like Jazz said, sunny back, loved it. Um, but other than that, I don't, I haven't got much open water experience other than on holiday, having a dip in the sea, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. <clears throat> um, but I did actually do a race in Lanzarote. I forgot about that. And the, the prize for that was a big bag of Haribo. So my coach sent me off and said, win it basically because my Harry were my favorite so I went in I won the race and loved it again and so yeah I've got a whole mixture of open water but I think Jazz is definitely the expert for that one I mean you should see some of the I think we we did a film on open water recovery from our YouTube channel and the pond that we swam in for it it was the only one we could find kind of like last minute notice we couldn't see the bottom it was mud everywhere luckily the footage looked good from out out of the pond um, but inside it wasn't the most pleasant experience in the world okay so we we could talk on this podcast for ages about so many different topics but if we kind of bring it to a conclusion with a few kind of deep meaningful questions let's let, let's go that way so today as we're recording this podcast was your podcast season finale what is the plan moving forwards with the podcast is it going to come back later on in the year is it is that just how you guys break up kind of like seasons within the podcast? Um, me and Jazz have actually fallen out. We're not doing it anymore. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, J- Jazz and I are, that's the season one done. Yeah. We, uh, we've we we've got some really exciting stuff coming. I don't think, I, we put out that it's the season one finale and a lot of people message like, no, please don't go. Like what's <laughs> going on? That means it's going, you're not going to be here for a long time and we'll be back a lot sooner than you probably think. Mm. Um, but we just want to take some time, make sure we, we've we had a great first season. We're really proud of what we've done so far and the response has been incredible and we just want to build on that. And so we don't want to keep just rushing and trying to get episodes out. We want to make sure that what we put out is is good stuff. You know, It's stuff that's going to make a difference, hopefully, and help people. And so that's not something that should be taken lightly. You know, we, we realize we're in a lucky position to have, you know, a bit of an audience to be able to talk to people. And so we, we want to make sure that we get it right. What, what the content that we're, we're putting out there. So I don't know if Jazz wants to build on that. No, exactly the same. I think we've loved doing it so far and it was just, um, to give ourselves a bit of time to plan the next who we who we'd like to speak to and those important topics really and make sure that we we do it right so we've yeah we've absolutely loved it and we um can't wait to be back doing it again and uh yeah hopefully then we might be back to some kind of swimming as well which would be quite nice and um yeah it's just been really nice to connect with people and the, the messages and support we've had so far do you have a rough idea of who you want to get onto the podcast and what sort of topics you're going to be talking about that would be yeah. telling. We aren't, oh, I'm we trying aren't to sell giving it for our you. right information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so kind of big question. The whole of our podcast, your podcast, is all about helping kind of other people through their journey of swimming. What's the one most important lesson that you guys learned throughout your career? Big question. Quigley, on <laughs> <laughs> Both avoiding the question. <laughs> the one biggest lesson, did you say? Yeah. Oh, I think, I mean, there are so many, Mm. there are so, so many and it's so personal. I think for me, I often questioned myself whether I was good enough and didn't always have the confidence. Um, So the biggest lesson for me was always believe in myself and never stop, never like set the ceiling, set the bar a certain height, just see where you can take it and um always have the belief and confidence in yourself because you just never know where it it can take you in all aspects of life and to make sure you enjoy it have fun smile and enjoy every minute because obviously um from the competing side of it it doesn't last forever but sport obviously I'm hoping swimming will be a part of my life forever but um yeah just to make sure you enjoy it have fun and take it all in that's a like Jazz said that's like an impossible question really (laughs) If you asked me that tomorrow, I'd probably give a different answer. And the next day, different answer. I think there's so many things that you learn. You can't possibly just pinpoint one as being the biggest. One thing I always say, and it's everyone says it, but there's a reason everyone says it, is to enjoy it. That's number one. 
it's not worth it. It's a lot to do if you don't enjoy it. So a happy swimmer is a fast swimmer. Simple. Enjoy it. Um, one the biggest thing, though, I, like I said, it's impossible. Uh, I think trust, trust in yourself. And I think honest communication, I like to say, with coaches, with support staff, with other teammates, parents. If you're honest and you communicate, you know, how you're feeling or whatever it is, then you can't really go wrong. Obviously, you've got to train hard and all that. But again, we're then going into one big, long talk, TED talk from Lauren that's do this, do that. You know, there's so much. But yeah, just be honest about how you're feeling and and just be open, communicate, because it's a uh, it can be a very lonely road if you go down the, the, the route of not communicating. Mm. And I think it's so important that it's a journey that it's it is an individual sport, but it's not. So be open about it. For sure. I'll tell you what, I've never thrown this question at Dan. Oh, and seeing as you were an elite swimmer, let's get, let's get you to give an answer for this as yeah, well. Yeah, Dan, come on. Oh. In the hot seat. The, the, what was the question? The biggest life sort of... Dan's like, what? What's going oh. on? What's the question? <laughs> I wasn't the expecting podcast. it to be thrown at me. Um, <laughs> the one lesson that I've... Uh, I, enjoyment is definitely up there, but I don't want to repeat that. I don't want to say that again. Um, the one thing, I think, except failure. Failure is actually a good thing that you, you learn more from failing than you do winning from a young, a young age. So I think um, and a lot of younger swimmers, especially see them losing and actually not taking anything from it. And um, that's where the coaches should come in and say, actually by swimming third or where, wherever you've come, actually that's a good thing for the long term for the next race or whatever in years to come. So yeah, accepting failure is also right up there. I think that's what I would say. Scott, do you want to answer it as well or not? No, No, I'm okay. I'm the host. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we should let you off so lightly, you know. I'm not let sure. Let me off. <laughs> yeah, go on. No, we shouldn't. Um, oh, I just say be kind to yourself. Don't don't kind of knock yourself down when because I that's why I dropped out because my times weren't improving. So maybe if that mindset had changed and I was a bit kinder and kind of looked at it from a bigger angle of enjoyment then maybe it might have panned out differently but yeah be kind don't don't be too hard on yourself really okay so to end this podcast as we usually do with our elite swimmers is we do some quick fire questions are you guys up for these yeah i'm gonna unmute myself i'm ready to go okay <laughs> so Let's... what was your favorite event in swimming 400 free i reckon i'm gonna go 50 free uh, who was your swimming idol? Hold on, wait a second. Jess, you know I swam that at the World Championships one year. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> Girl. <laughs> Looking at me as if, phew, 53. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. Um, who was your swimming idol? Josh Carlin. <laughs> I'm being serious. I'm sticking with that answer. I don't really remember. I've got a terrible memory. I remember just when I was younger going to like the Olympic trials in 2004 when I was 13 and watching everyone and I was like in the queue getting everyone's signature. But I don't really remember who I was in the queue for. <laughs> Mark Foster, maybe? I think I was in the queue okay. for him. <laughs> um, what's your proudest moment in swimming? Oh, tough one. Um, it depends what you define. I think there's various different things and moments that you could call back on. Um, proudest moment was probably, I would say, winning gold for Wales at the Commonwealth Games in 2014. But it was more than just um, winning a gold medal. It was my family being there. My cousins were there in Go Jazz Tops. And it was like the defining moment for me because I just... Um, well, after missing out on the London 2012 Olympics, that was kind of like my breakout swim that gave me the the confidence and belief in myself that I could go on to to Rio. Sorry, I know these are meant to be quick fire, but I would say that one, yeah. <laughs> I would go by winning my first British title, making the World Championship team when I was quite young. Um, what's the hardest set you've ever done? I think others would see different sets as quite yeah. hard. I think mentally like 10 800s is always tough mm. um 
but then probably I've done a lot harder sessions with pain wise. Mm. I always found 3100 best average, one of the toughest sets I think to do. I think mentally 100 hundreds, every 10th one fly off 75 or, but pain wise, 650s, um, balls to the wall. If I'm allowed to say that, uh, <laughs> defending rest. Oh. Um, and then if you guys are going to go on a road trip, let's say you go together, who are the other two people in the car with you? It could be anyone, celebrities, family, anyone. Tell you what, I'd probably take my old coach, David Minotti. I'd take Nutty for sure, because he'd just be so funny. We'd have a great time. I don't it think we'd need another one if we had Nutty. Room <laughs> <laughs> so for a dog? Fun. <laughs> yeah the dog Bertie the dog that'll do <laughs> <laughs> okay guys thank you so much for giving up your evening to come join us on this week's episode of the Holstein Swimming Podcast I think the work you're doing with your podcast and sharing the word of swimming to the younger generation and life lessons is something that is really important so I'm glad we've had you on to talk about some topics there are so many more that we could talk about um me and dan will continue to promote your podcast across all our platforms because we love the work that you're doing um and yeah hopefully we can speak to you guys again soon oh that's great thank you thank you yeah thank you and um right back at you really because we know we we see what you're doing and we also think what you're doing is great so keep that up i think more people that do stuff like that it to help in swimming in any way they can is absolutely fantastic and it's needed so um vice versa for sure well we really look forward to when the next uh, the next season starts mm. yeah we couldn't get the guests out of them but we, we'll see <laughs> we'll see <laughs> thank you very much thanks guys okay thanks. so thanks everyone for joining us on this week's episode of the propulsion swimming podcast if you haven't subscribed to us yet please feel free to do so on youtube or all your other podcast providing platforms i've been scott my co-host has been Dan and thank you so much for Jazz and Lauren joining us. We will catch you all in the next one. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.